it's really easy to spend your life chasing proxies and like other targets, chasing things that society says you should want. Yes. And I think the more you can think about what you actually want, uh, the better your answers get and the more straightforward the path becomes. Like there's a lot of stuff you don't have to do. You may not need to climb the corporate ladder. Society might tell you that you should do it, but like that may not be relevant at all to what you want to achieve. But it's really easy to find yourself locked into a career for 10 years just because that was like where the momentum of life carried you. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. I dare say a special episode. We are joined today from Columbus, Ohio by James Clear, author of Atomic Habits. Uh, and Ben, you were just saying before we before I hit record that Atomic Habits might be the book that you reference or recommend more than any other. And it's certainly something we've well, talked about a lot here. It, it, it's one. It's in. It's in my short list of favorites. It's one of the ones that I've. I've. I go back to and um, look at frequently. And um, it's so easy. Um, James, you've done a great job writing, man. It's. Uh, and it's so easy to app- make it applicable to real life. So in my job, you know, I, I'm a performance coach, and I try and create change. And I mean, that's literally. That's the deal. As much as we want to talk about the X's and O's of of nutrition or sports or anything else. The bottom line of this whole thing is um, creating change, changing behaviors, changing mindsets, changing routines. Um, and I, from there's so many nuggets to massive things that, um, you know, I, Patrick, I, I might be hijacking right now. And um, That's okay. James, I want to hear you talk, but like, I can't not, the biggest one for me is environment. Like, uh, and, um, God, when I read about the environment through whether like the, the way that you set up a cafeteria for drinks or, you know, um, how to, how to break addictions, it really kind of reframed the, the kind of the hierarchy for me of how you create change in somebody. So, um, I know I'm already diving right into it, but, um, first, I guess, James, awesome to have you on the show, man. Thank you. <laughs> no, thanks for saying that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you, uh, glad you enjoyed it and are finding it useful. I feel like you know what you said, like you work in reality, you try to create change. I think that's the ultimate test of whether an idea is good or not. Does it hold up to reality? You know, is it practical? Is it useful? So um, that means a lot to me. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, yeah, excited to talk today. Cool. Are you are you writing another book? Uh, I have agreed to a second book. I probably <laughs> should be further along on it than I am. Uh, but yes, it is. It is happening. There's a good book um, I could recommend that helps you establish some good habits. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, my editor said that to me at some point. You know, it took me, depending on how you measure it, between three to five years to write Atomic Habits, and. Um, she just said, like, you know, I was in the middle of it and it was taking forever. And she was like, we write the books we need. And um, I definitely <laughs> felt that many times. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, guys. So um, I thought we'd do something that I hope is kind of fun. James, you send out every Thursday, and I highly recommend it. You send out something called the 321 newsletter. Um, I've actually got one in my inbox uh, right now. And so what I did is, and what I thought we could do is, I went back through uh, the year so far of your 321 newsletter. And part of that newsletter is uh, three thoughts from you. Um, and these are always very thought provoking, uh, pithy ideas, thoughts. Um, and so I went through and I pulled out, I think I've got six or seven here in front of me that I thought would be fun to listen to you and Ben kind of jam on, um, expand upon, expound upon as you guys see fit. Um, and so I, I think we'll just dive right into it. I'm going to start with one. Great. I'm going to start with the one that when I read it, I, I swore out loud um, because I was so annoyed at how true Man. it was and how challenging it is to make happen. And it's this. I'm so curious. <laughs> uh, you sent it out in May. It's this. It's you a don't practical. Swear, Patrick. That's why I'm I know so curious. I, don't. I did it by myself in my office, so nobody heard me. Um, it's a practical definition of opportunity cost. If you spend too much time working on good things, then you don't have much time left to work on great things. Understanding opportunity cost means eliminating good uses of time, and that's what makes it hard. I feel like a lot of you know nobody wants to waste time. 
But generally speaking, many of us understand that eliminating things that are broadly seen as a waste of time or not yep. that effective is fairly easy. You know, like we all know that we shouldn't be binging YouTube for, you know, 10 hours a day or that, you know, maybe we should like watch Netflix occasionally and that's great, but, you know, it shouldn't be taking up too much space in our schedule. But the items that are most dangerous, that are uh, the easiest to rationalize, are actually items like, say, four, five, and six on your to-do list. Yeah. Because you can look at that and you're like, hey, it's kind of important. Like, it's number four for a reason. But the truth is, numbers four, five, and six are distracting you from numbers one, two, and three. And you have to be ruthless about prioritizing. And I think that this is something I've felt in my own life, you know, as Atomic Habits has taken off and the books become more successful and, you know, new opportunities are coming your way. No matter what you're dealing with, whatever your career is, as you continue to expand your skill set and succeed more, the opportunity cost of your time increases. And so you get into this weird situation where things that used to be a good use of time, that things that maybe three years ago or four years ago you should have been spending time on, now you need to learn to say no to. And that list just continues to increase. So your threshold for saying yes has to raise as your mm. skills increase. And um, that's very hard to learn. And it's, again, it's easier to cut out the things that are a waste of time. It's much harder to say no to things that are a good use of time, but not a great use of time. And so that, I think, is what I, you know, I was trying to get at with that thought. Mm. So, yeah, so strong. Um, yeah, it's the it's, the, uh, it's that the old adage of um, good is the enemy of great. And I, to the word that I think is like so powerful there um, is that prioritization. And I think it's really easy for a lot of people. I think we just talked about this recently, Patrick. But this idea that um, you know I have um, my top five priorities. Well, the word priority should define your singular. It's the one, it's your priority. It's, it's just the, it's the one, it's the one above all else. And it goes back to that. I think it was um, Warren Buffett, that story. And you probably have, I probably heard this from you, James, honestly, um, where his pilot asked him, you know, what's the secret to success? And he said, well, let me give me, give me the, the 20 things that you wanna accomplish and you know, the, your 20 like goals that you wanna um, set for yourself. And the pilot dutifully did it. On the next flight, they came back. He said, all right, now narrow that list down to five. So, he went, oh, man, it's tough. And he narrowed it down to five. He goes, okay, here it is. Here's my top five things that I want to do. And he said, okay, now avoid numbers two through five at all cost. Like it's, it's about the one. And I think that's so powerful for all of us to recognize. I think it's okay to have one A, one B, one C and have other things that we want to do because they are good. Um, but to your point, I, I, I think that having that singular focus goes a long way. Um, this becomes increasingly important the, the higher that you want to climb. You know, like in a world of 7 billion people, you're going to find somebody who is going to spend almost every hour obsessively focused on that particular craft and trying to get better at it. And so... If you the 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 more exclusively you want to compete, the more the higher you want to climb in a particular domain, the more focused you need to be on that one priority, and you know eliminating things um, at at all other costs. Now, you know, not everybody wants that in every area, and that's fine. So if you know if you don't care about being at the 99th percentile of your given field, then uh, it's easier to balance that and to you know turn it on and turn it off. But uh, I do generally think that most of us would be better served by reducing the number of things that we focus on. You, this I think is just magnified by modern society. You see this fracturing of attention, um, and it happens because we all have, you know, it used to be for most of human history, information was rare, and uh, so the problem was getting access to it. Now, information is abundant. We, almost anyone, can access every bit of information instantly online. And so the, now the new skill is not access, but curation. Mm. And so learning to eliminate, refine, edit, curate the information that's coming to you, learning to separate the signal from the noise, both in what you consume and what you focus on, I think is more important now than it's ever been before. And he comes out, and I think a big, what you alluded to, which is like, it's, it's the saying no aspect. In the beginning, like, 
in the beginning, you saying yes to things is the most important thing. When your opportunities are presented to you, you saying yes, so you have a chance to get on a rocket ship, don't ask what seat, just get on the rocket ship. But mm-hmm. as you start to become the pilot of the ship, you got to start saying no to a lot of other things because you got to focus on one particular aspect. And we've never been presented with so many opportunities now. Opportunities come in a lot of different forms, and one of those forms, opportunities could also be called distractions. And it's mm-hmm. the it's the it's it's the ability to differentiate between opportunities and distractions, so you can go the mile deep, not necessarily the mile wide. But again, if well, it's, your point, it's not for everybody, and some people want the balance. The your point about opportunities can present or distractions can present as opportunities. Your most persistent distractions will seem rational to you. And that's like a really hard thing. Like you'll always have a good reason for doing them and that's why they persist. And so you have to be really ruthless about that and about um, like cutting through it and trying to get clear about what you really want. So how do you and do that? that? How I do you think get, ultimately how do you get, is. Yeah. How do you okay. get clear on what you really want? It's a great question. I feel like this is literally what I was just going to say is I feel like this conversation ultimately kind of comes back to that about this understanding yourself and being clear about what you really want, because that allows you to make those hard choices. And I've done this exercise for the last few weeks now where I start my day, I open up a blank sheet of paper, uh, my notebook, and I just write at the top of the page, what do I really want? Mm. And it's surprising how answering the same question repeatedly can still be useful. Like you would think Mm. it'd get boring and you're like, you just keep writing the same things down. But actually your answers get more precise. Stuff that you used to write down that you thought was like the end goal, it turns out that's just a middle step and you can like cut it out entirely. And, And the more clear that I am about that, the more I start to answer that question, you... The next thing that that I do is I write down that answer, whatever it happens to be for the day. And then I just try to come up with, I don't know, three or five things that I could do to like move toward that. And I don't, the goal is not to like do all five of those every day. It's just, I'm trying to find something that I could do that day. And it's funny, you know, last week I like wrote down my answer and then came up with this little list and I got one of those things done. And it's like so straightforward, but you know, that day ended and I could literally say I took a step to getting closer to my ideal life or whatever I wanted to achieve. And it's not hard, but I don't know that most of us have good answers to that. I think most people, they kind of like broadly know what they want. You know, I want to be healthy or I want to be in the best shape of my life or I want more money or I want to have low stress. Like we kind of generally know, but we don't precisely know. And um, this is just to kind of wrap this up with one more thing I feel like I've realized from this exercise is that you, you, uh, in a lot of areas of life, to succeed, you have to somehow simultaneously hold two competing thoughts in mind. They seem like opposites, but they really serve you well to have both. So for this particular area, the two things I tried to hold in mind, the first is I want to be really clear about where I want to go. What am I really trying to do here? What am I really trying to achieve? And so for that stage, I like like to use the phrase of like, I try to work backwards from magic. Like what would the magical mm-hmm. outcome be? And then let's work backwards from there. And then um, the second step, though, is I want to be super crystal clear about where I want to go, but I also want to be very flexible about how I get there because nobody can predict the future and you have to be adaptable to circumstances that they change and so on. So it's kind of like I can see the mountaintop in the distance. I know what I'm moving toward, but between me and the mountain is this like vast expanse of fog. And I don't know how I'm going to get through the fog, but I, I trust that I'll be able to figure it out along the way. Kind of, it's kind of like that. There's a famous quote about writing where it says, you know, writing is like driving a car through the fog. You can only see five feet in front of you, but you can make the whole trip that way. Mm. And it's sort of like that, you know, like I, I know where the destination is. I know that I'm directionally correct, but I'm also very flexible about what I'm doing on a daily basis to get there, spring on top of a new opportunity, whatever. Um, so anyway, I feel like both of those things help you with that kind of prioritization aspect. I love that. I love the aspect of, uh, the, um, getting more specific, how we start off with that vague understanding. Can you, would you be willing to share kind of like maybe where you started? Like what that question, like in the early two weeks ago, when you started writing it down, what did that look like? And what is it kind of mm. morphed into? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have, I actually have the notebook in front of me. I got some of the answers here. Um, like, uh, you know, Okay, so I'm looking. I'm looking back here a couple of weeks, and there are more answers that are specifically about money, like uh, you know how many books to sell a year, or how much money to make in the business, or things like that. And then, like I'm looking at my answers. If I flip to my answers from yesterday, uh, there's only one 
that is related to money and there's many more that are about like lifestyle. And I think the the insight that I had was like one of the things I wrote down yesterday is enjoy the ideal blend of city and country life. Mm. And I like I basically grew up on my grandparents' farm, so I love being outdoors and would prefer to, you know, do that, but it's helpful for me for my job and business and other reasons to live in a city. Um and uh, so I think what I was getting to is I thought money was the solution, but actually it wasn't really about the money at all. Like it's just, that's just a number on a screen. Um, and actually what I really wanted was the lifestyle it would provide. And so I was starting yeah. to get more precise about that. And the funny thing is, you know, you come up with these numbers that you think, oh, if I just had that, then I'd be set. But actually you're like, actually I can live a lot of that life. Like I can live 80% of that lifestyle right now. You know, like I don't need any money to do that. So there's uh that's what I meant when I said like you can cut out middle steps. If you're very precise about what you actually want, like one of my favorite things um, is in the mid morning, I take a little break from working and I just try to, my grand, I got this from my grandpa. He used to, he found a spot in, in his house where the corner of the, the house would block the wind, but it mm-hmm. was still in the sun. And he would like go and just sit in the sun for like 10 minutes each day. And I love doing that and just taking that little break. I don't need a penny to do that. But like it, it, to just to be clear about it and to write it down um, makes it more precise, and I start to understand what I actually want. Um, and so I feel like that whole exercise helps clarify some of that stuff. It's really easy to spend your life chasing proxies and like other targets, chasing things that society says you should want. Yes. And I think the more you can think about what you actually want, uh, the better your answers get, and the more straightforward the path becomes. Like there's a lot of stuff you don't have to do. You may not need to climb the corporate ladder. Society might tell you that you should do it, but like that may not be relevant at all to what you want to achieve. But it's really easy to find yourself locked into a career for 10 years just because that was like where the momentum of life carried you. Do you see a day where you write, you go to do that exercise and there's um, all those things are kind of like you're done? Like, like you can sit in the sun. You can blend the city life and farm life. You can... Um, you have reached the number on the screen. I don't know. Um, you know, if I'm being honest, I don't know that my makeup is to be done. I think I kind <laughs> of like enjoy the process of it. Um, and the other thing is that life is dynamic. It's not static. So like, you know, circumstances change. So that's probably going to change the answers. Also, I'm a different person today than I was 10 years ago. And I'll probably be different 10 years from now than I am today. And so I'm going to want different things at different times. Um, You know, you want different things based on whether you have kids or not, whether your kids are five years old or 25 years old. And um, so as life continues to change, uh, I think those answers change. So I I really feel like it's a process uh, and it's the habit of reflection and review that's useful, not Mm -hmm. necessarily that like there is a finish line. You know, there it's not it's not a, a finish line. It's a lifestyle. Okay, so why is that? Why is that? Because this is what you speak a lot about, and I, I, I love it. Why is the habit? Why does? Why is the habit of um, going through the exercise? Kind of. Why does the value lie in that and not in the outcome? Well, uh, so I have two answers to this, but the first answer, which is a little more specific to this exercise, I generally find questions to be more valuable than advice, um, and the reason is that advice is kind of brittle. It only applies in like a very narrow window. So even if you're talking to somebody who they achieved what you want to achieve, say two years ago, or they, you know, they're very relevant, they're in the same field, they got very similar circumstances. Um, you know, they may have different strengths than you, so that may not apply. Or uh, the situation, the the environment may have changed, and so it may not apply. Or for countless other reasons, it might not be a perfect fit. But if you have a good question, you can carry that around with you from environment to environment. And it can kind of reveal the answer Mm. based on the current circumstances and your strengths. So like um, one of the questions that I like, I mentioned this in Atomic Habits, there's a a woman who, a reader of mine, who she ended up losing over 100 pounds. She's kept it off for, I think, over a decade now. But one of the first questions that she asked herself was when she went around uh, and like lived her normal day, she just had this question in the back of her mind of what would a healthy person do? And so if I'm deciding what to order for lunch, what would a healthy person order? I've got my next meeting coming up in 20 minutes. Do I walk five blocks or do I take a cab? What would a healthy person do? And she just used that question over and over again, and the answer kind of reveals itself. So I think that's one reason why the process is very valuable, because this process of asking this question, yourself this question again and again sort of reveals the answer. But then the more big picture thing, and this is something I talk about in the book in much more detail, is just I generally think that 
Goals are important, and we've already talked about that. We've talked about the importance of you know knowing where you want to go, knowing what you want to achieve. But when it comes to actually executing, you don't really rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And so it's much more about the habits and the process, the Ben, what you brought up earlier, the environment that you create. And I like to think of, you know, if we put a little more precise wording on that, what is your, uh, what is your goal? It's the target. It's the outcome. What is your system? It's the collection of habits that you follow. It's like each little habit is kind of like a gear in that overall machine. And so by refining the habits, by tweaking the environment, by upgrading the social environment that you hang out with, you're optimizing that system to, to get a better result. And, um, you know, goals are useful. They provide a sense of direction and clarity. They can act as a filter, so it's easier to say no to things. But ultimately, the winners and the losers often have the same goals. Um, actually, I feel like, Ben, maybe you had mentioned that to me at some point when we were talking. You're like, um, you know, if you think about any Olympian, right? You got 20 people competing in the event. Presumably, they all have the goal of right. winning the gold medal, right? Yeah. Um, it's not the goal that separates them. It's the the system that they follow. So, Anyway, I think those are both reasons to to focus on uh, the process or the lifestyle rather than the outcome or the result. Let's jump to another one. Uh, you sent this out in in uh, also in May actually. Entrepreneurship is a personal growth engine disguised as a business pursuit. It's definitely been true for me. I learned more <laughs> about myself through building a business. I've been an entrepreneur for uh, uh, over ten years now, and yeah, it's just um, you when you are when the business will not survive if you don't make an uncomfortable uh, choice or have a tough conversation or uh, do something that is challenging, you're forced to do those things. And in many areas of life, you can avoid the uncomfortable thing. Um, I came across a saying recently that's kind of stuck with me since I read it, which is your success in life will largely be determined by the uncomfortable uh, conversations you're willing to have. And, and I think that that is every entrepreneur, leader, manager, whatever, you have to do that stuff because the business depends on it. And if you don't do it, you're, you don't have an income. So um, your hand is forced. And I think that leads to a lot more personal growth than people would expect or realize. I also, you know, I don't know that I would be an entrepreneur if I didn't work out consistently. And so there's this connection between taking care of yourself so that you can actually run the business well. And so in that way, your hand is also forced, you know, like I, there are a lot of days where I feel like I'm fumbling around. I'm not making, doing anything productive. I haven't made progress. The business didn't get better today, but at least I got a good workout in. And there are so many days where like, that was the thing that saved me from going to bed and feeling like I had wasted it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's another thing that I feel like, uh, entrepreneurship has kind of forced me into. And it's this personal growth journey in disguise. Yeah. I, I love that. I think I, you know, there's a lot of parallels between entrepreneurship and what, what I do in, you know, um, coaching athletics. It's, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, if you're a factory worker or you work on, a, you know, a, if you have a really well-defined role inside of a massive organization, there's not as much autonomy into what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's kind of, you have total freedom to pursue whatever it is today that you deem most Important and meaningful and impactful. And it's the same thing as um, athletics because you go into the gym that day and it's like, hey, no one's forcing your hand. No one's saying you have to do these things. There is a system that you put in front of you that says like, this is what's going to get me closest to my goals. But ultimately it's up to you and your personality skills slash traits, your discipline, your um, grit, your fortitude, your um, tenacity, your competitiveness, that's going to get you closer to that finish line. It's the same thing with business. And then what's going to happen in both of those scenarios guaranteed is adversity, whether it's an injury or a competitor, or it's a, a product line doesn't work out. And then you have to use the personal skills to overcome that um, potential obstacle. I like the quote from, I think it's Mark Allen, who's a, I believe, six-time Ironman world champion who said, racing is a test of you as a person on top of a test of you as an athlete. I think that's the same type of thing that we're talking about here, which is there is the 
X's and O's. There's the hard skills that come along with whatever we're chasing. And then there is the quote unquote soft skills. But it's, you know, what James was just saying is I believe your success is more closely tied to the way you approach those soft skills, particularly in entrepreneurship, particularly in athletics than it is in a lot of other fields. Well, there's you- this like important distinction between, um, between, be- ha- between being right and having been right. And like a lot of people are very focused on having been right, on making sure that they look good. But in entrepreneurship, your business does not care. The customer Mm -hmm. does not care if you were right or not. They only care if it was right. And so you're also forced to check your ego in a lot of ways. Like that intellectual humility, I feel like is an essential quality. And if you don't have it, you need to cultivate it. Because if you're only focused on having been right, you often get the wrong answer. And um, so, you know, there's a, yeah, there's a very much a mental game that's associated with it. And that what you're mentioning, Ben, about like, it's a test of you as a person. That is very much a test of your ability to be humble and to check your ego and to focus on the team and many, many other uh, qualities that are related to that. Um, but I, I think you're, you're forced into those situations uh, in, with entrepreneurship. And that is definitely a powerful thing about it. Well, I love the, the the humility aspect of this too on the, the personal side because I think that the role and responsibility of the entrepreneur first and foremost is to surround themselves with people smarter than they are. Like that's really what the job is, is get people that are better than you at marketing and bring them in. Now you're in charge of marketing. Bring people that are better at finance. Now you're in charge of the finance. Bring people better in at X, Y, and Z. And your job is to get the collective group. You become the leader in trying to pull the most out of them. If you have an ego there and you need to be the smartest guy in the room, your business is not going to flourish like it would otherwise. What, um, what, how have you guys learned to, because part of that process, James, that you're just talking about, part of that is or requires a certain amount of feedback. And Ben, I think that this is a little bit what you're just talking about, but I'm curious from both of you, in, maybe in the earlier days when you didn't have the ability to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you when you are, were in fact re- responsible for, if it's you're going to push the business forward, it's on you to figure out how to do that. How did you guys both um, create, create the, the opportunities to learn when you didn't have people you could lean on? How did you get past, whether it was ego or education or experience, to get to that next level when you didn't have somebody else's experience, somebody else's intelligence to lean against? Well, I'll, I'll jump on this I, first. I don't know answer. what... Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Ben. I, I, I started reading. Honestly, like I never read in in school. I never... I, I don't even know if I honestly... My honest... I don't know if I ever read a book in school. I read a lot of Cliff Notes. <clears throat> uh but I don't know if I ever read a full book like start to finish ever. And when I, and honestly, I don't know if it was, I don't know what the, what it was about it, but when I started going into business for myself, like I picked up a book. Um, and the first book, I think the first book I read was um, in defense of food because I wanted, my mom was like, Hey, if you're going to be a, a trainer, you need to know about nutrition. And she gave me, she's like, I think you would like this. So I read it, I read it, covered it. I was like, wow, and you learn things. It's kind of addictive. Like, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I have like, my skill set's bigger. I can talk more to people about different stuff. I can answer questions. So then I was like, wow, like if I could, and I think the next one was um, probably uh, like Covey's Seven Habits, um, Covey's. And, um, you know, and it culminated all the way through. And that's how we got, got connected with James reading his book. It's like, mm-hmm. that's, um, so it took it up, you know, it's again to that personality aspect with just like a growth mindset, you know, and like this like um, eagerness to hone your skills. Well, and your point about, you know, not reading during school, it, if you're assigned something, you're not that invested in it. And I think one of the keys, if you want to read more, or if you feel like, oh, I'm not a reader, but I can see the value in that, is read books that are relevant to what you want to achieve. If it's relevant to what you want to achieve, it's never going to seem boring because it's going to be helping you propel forward. And so, you know, you just gave an example of that. It's like, I want to be a successful coach. Great. I'm going to read this nutrition book because that's relevant to what I want my life to be like. Um, so that that helps a lot. But anyway, reading has definitely been a big one for me as well. Um, another thing that was really valuable, I um, 
I did not have any entrepreneurs in my family, so I didn't really have anybody to look to who was close to me for you know what that would look like or whether this was normal. Um, and it is funny how surrounding yourself with people who have the habits that you want to have, you can like rise together. And you start to see it feels very normal to see that now. Like I, you know, I have a bunch of friends who have successful companies now, and that's not a normal thing in like the broad span of like the global universe and how many people are on the planet. But it's normal within this friend group that I have, and so it doesn't seem intimidating to me anymore. It just seems mm -hmm. like, well, they're all doing it. Why couldn't I do it? And um, in order to get that, I did two different things. the The first three months that I was in business, I sent out. I think it was probably. I, I'll say between 100 and 300, I don't remember exactly, but a couple hundred emails to people who, whoever I could find really online that was already running a business like what I wanted to run. And I just asked if they wanted to chat on Skype for like 30 minutes. And just, I was like, hey, I'm starting a business like this too, you know, whatever, I love what you're up to, blah, blah, blah. And um, most of them didn't get back to me, but by the time I got like six months in or so, I had talked to about 30 of those people and so I had, you know, at least a couple people that I could go to with questions and stuff. And that was really helpful. And then I ended up going to a conference and I think about 10 of those 30 attended it too. It was like, you know, a conference sort of for our industry. And um, then I got to meet him in person. And now suddenly you've got relationships, you have friends, you have people you know who are also doing the thing. And so that helped a lot in the beginning. The other thing that I did is that depending on what you want to achieve, or again, you know, the more specific you are about, you know, what you really want, you, it might be hard. There might not already be groups for you to join. Like it may not be some ready made solution. So you might have to do it on your own. So, what I do is I host retreats every year. I try to get seven or eight other authors together who write books the way that I want to write them or who I uh, create work that I would aspire to. And, um, you know, I handle organizing everything and we all split the cost and we just hang out for three or four days. And everybody gets to talk about their business and their book and have time in front of the group and get feedback. And, and creating that space is really valuable. Those are almost always some of the most high value weekends of my entire year. And so uh, my point is that, you know, if you don't have that group, if you can't afford to hire that group yet, um, being the person that brings those people together. I mean, you know, if you can't afford to put together a retreat, just do it on Zoom. Do a, you know, do like a virtual conference, so to speak, a roundtable session or workshop with five or six or seven people that you really aspire to create work like. And just by being virtue of the person who puts it together, you'll be providing value and uh, you'll get a chance to connect with people who have the habits and uh, behaviors that you want to have. This actually, that actually rem, um, is reminiscent of one of the other uh, quotes that I pulled. So I'm just going to read it. It costs nothing to ask a successful person how they succeeded, but it may deliver more value than a thousand hours of hard work. Others are under no obligation to tell you their secrets, but it is surprising how much you can learn from sincere, direct, and thoughtful questions. People just don't ask. People don't, you know, it's like, just be, uh, you know, if you're just straightforward about what you want to achieve, go, go ask. Like they're literally the worst thing that could happen is they're just like, no. And then like life moves on. This becomes much easier once you've done it once or twice. I think we build it up in our heads. It reminds me of, I, so one of my hobbies that I like to do is photography. And occasionally I, I went on a trip one time and I was like, I want to take more portraits this time. I like never take pictures of people. I'm always doing landscapes and cityscapes and stuff. And so. So I decided I was just going to do kind of like a humans in New York sort of thing and just go up to strangers and ask them if I could take their picture. And you can feel this internal resistance at first. It's like awkward. You're like, ah, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to like, you know, what if I ask the wrong person or they're having a bad day or you come across pushy and then you work up the courage to do it once or twice. And uh, almost always the first ones say no, but you get through it and you realize, oh, Nothing happened. Like I survived, you know, there's no big deal. And, um, and so I actually think you need to get a couple no's under your belt and then it becomes much easier to do those things. But yeah, just the general idea of asking, um, for advice, for, uh, questions, for how people handled a situation, for strategies, for how they built their business, whatever it is, uh, it's surprising how a gracious, straightforward, well-written cold email can be super fruitful and helpful and uh, people just don't do it. All right. I got another one. Um, this one might be a slightly lighter topic, but I thought it was funny. Most topics are not worth having an opinion about. That feels particularly relevant in the uh, current, current time in which we are talking. 
most effort in life is wasted. Uh, most time <laughs> is wasted on things that don't really matter. Uh, and I am just as guilty of this as anybody else. Um, you know, like the, the truth is, if we want to take some dark stance on it, nothing really matters. You know, <laughs> in the eventual heat death of the universe, like none of this is really that relevant. Um, but the great thing about life is you get to choose what matters to you. You get to choose what is meaningful and what is valuable and what you want to focus your attention and energy on. And um, I think that, you know, going back to where we started this conversation, you can choose one or two or three things that are where you want to spend your time. Like I played baseball in college and uh, sure, in some big global sense, baseball does not matter. But man, I tell you what, in my personal sense, in my personal life, it mattered a great deal to me. It was like incredibly meaningful. I built some of the most important relationships in my life. I've discovered myself. I, you know, challenged myself to compete at a high level. And I loved that about it. And so um, for me, it was much more than just a game. Um, and I think it's important to realize, like, what are those things that really matter to you? And also that 99% of life does not fall in that category. And so most things are not worth having an opinion about. Most things are not worth investing the time or energy. I um, This is something I said in today's newsletter, which is just one of my new favorite phrases is, you're probably right. Mm. Because whenever people bring up something, I'm just like, yeah, you're probably right, and move on. Like You can just shrug, say you're probably right, and move on with your day. The To not need to win trivial arguments is like a great skill to have. Um, it just allows you to save energy and time and move on with life. And uh, you can focus on what does matter to you rather than getting wrapped up in a bunch of minutia or details or whatever. I, I, th I think that's so fabulous. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you know, EQ, um, you know, in terms of people smarts, it's the people that get wrapped up into the minutia of storytelling that um, relay unnecessary details. It's people that um, have trouble kind of focusing on what truly is important in the conversation that have the hardest time communicating with people. Well, it's the same thing with us internally, I believe. If you have a hard time deciphering what truly is important to you and you get wrapped up in all the minutia of all the distractions around you, you can get so easily have your focus get pulled in the wrong direction. And I think that, that the license to not have an opinion is such a freeing thing for all of us. If you, if you listen to the conversations that are happening around most of us, you know, I like the, I think it's the Eleanor Roosevelt quote, which is, um, you know, small people talk about other people, average people will talk about events, great people talk about ideas. When you think about what most people are actually spending their time talking about, it is not big, massive ideas that are going to reshape your framework of the universe and move you along as a human being. They're rehashing old events. Usually they're like, oh, remember when dot, 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 or they're talking crap about people, whether it's politics, celebrities, it's gossip, it's something else. If we can reframe from getting pulled into those type of conversations simply by not having an opinion, you're probably right. I love that. Like we get to move our lives forward the way we want to, as James said, like you have the choice. You get to choose what you focus on and what you focus on, you see more of. So if you focus on the gossip and the crap, you're gonna see more of the gossip and the crap. If you focus on the big massive ideas, you'll kind of gravitate towards those things and those things will gravitate towards you. Uh, I like to call it being selectively ignorant. You know, it's like I, I'm gonna. Uh, you choose to not engage or to not uh, stay up on everything. Nobody can. There's no. It's not possible. So um, that's fine. Do, you know, don't put that pressure on yourself. You don't need to stay up on everything. You don't need to have an opinion on everything. Just have an opinion on the things that matter to you and the people you love and the things that you love, um, and focus on those with your best effort and energy. And um, yeah. It's it's also ironic too because the more time you spend wasted uh, wasting on this other external stuff, things that you don't control in most cases, um, the less time that you have to focus on what you do control and actually making yourself a better person or contributing something meaningful to the people that are around you. So it's often much better to to ignore that stuff anyway because it's not not something that you control. Yeah, we have we have a, a finite amount of resources, whether that's time, energy, money focus, calories, whatever it is, you have a finite number of 
um, energy that you can put towards something. And to your point, if you put it towards the things that aren't going to move you towards your goals, aren't going to be things that are inside your control, you have less to push yourself to where you want to go. So I think we can all all, all take a little bit of the, the selective ignorance um, into our lives. All right, last one that we've got from your 321 newsletter. The paradox of freedom. The way to expand your freedom is to narrow your focus. Stay focused on saving to achieve financial freedom. Stay focused on training to achieve physical freedom. Stay focused on learning to achieve intellectual freedom. We've definitely touched on a little bit of that today, but. Well, there's this weird little paradox, yeah, that um, what everybody wants is more options, more freedom, more flexibility. Uh, but actually, the way to get that is by being more disciplined, by being more focused, by being uh, by you know narrowing your options in the short term so that you can expand them in the long term. And it's almost always the person who remains focused early on that has more options available to them later. You know, it's the person who stays focused on learning that feels like they're ahead of the curve and they've got, you know, they're like mentally adept. The person who has terrible learning habits or reading habits always feels like they're behind the curve. Um, it's the person who stays focused on saving and kind of has their financial habits in order that feels like they have the capacity to pay for things or to pursue new experiences. The people with the worst financial habits uh, often have the least amount of money available. And so there's this weird paradox. A lot of times people resist habits because they're like, well, I don't want to pigeonhole myself. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to live like a robot. But the truth is habits don't restrict freedom. They create it, you know, like they, it's by being disciplined that you create the capacity to have more flexibility and freedom and so on in other areas of your life. So I think in many ways, the path to freedom is through focus. Yeah. I th I, I've spoken about before. It's the people that, uh, that proactively, seek out experiencing short-term pain are the ones that avoid long-term pain. So to your point, if you go and you save a little bit today, that saving isn't fun. Like everyone would rather spend it today, spend today. But if you save, then all of a sudden later on, you won't have the pain. If you say no to the chocolate chip cookies and say yes to the salad, well now like it's, it's more it's, it's, that's painful because it's easier to have the chocolate chip cookie. You have that health freedom later on. It's the, the working out, the experiencing the little bit of discomfort today. And that's, I think the, the crux of a lot of people's habit formation is that you're at, we're asking people to experience, call it pain, discomfort, something new without the promise of that actually paying off later on. So Jay, how do you, I, you talk a lot about habit formation. I mean, that's your entire book is kind of about that. What is your, what, what's the suggestion that you have for people that are going through that? They're trying to create new habits. Um, they are, um, they're aware of kind of the habit formation and the habit loop. They know about like um, cue, habit, response, reward, all that. And there, it's still not. It's still not sticking. It's still not um, their new. It's not their new habit. It's still a lot of work, and they're not seeing the fruits of their labor. They haven't seen the rewards. How do you? I guess the question is: Do you recommend that they push through, or how how do they push through? Yeah, it's an important question, and kind of the central thing that you're getting at is the importance of delayed gratification, and that's a huge element of building better habits and just generally getting better results in life. Like one of the ways that I summarize the difference between a good habit and a bad habit is that the cost of your good habits is in the present. You know, you're putting that that uh, reward off. The cost of your bad habits is in the future. They often feels great in the short term, but mm. you end up having the bill comes due at some point, and you end mm. up having to pay that back. And so a lot of the, the challenge of building good habits and breaking bad ones is figuring out ways to pull the long-term rewards of your good habits into the present moment. So you feel a little bit of, you feel it feels good right now and to pull the long-term consequences or cost of your bad habits into the present moment. And some of this can be done through clever design. So um, one of the examples that I like, Danelle Meadows is a famous systems engineer and she was talking about how could we reduce pollution and she was like, what if manufacturing facilities who put pollution into water, into a river or something next to their facility, 
What if they were required to take up water for their facility downstream? So the very first place that feels the effects is themselves. Um, you would probably see behavior change. Or another example that I like, uh, Boeing, when, I think this is in the 1990s, when their engineers first switched to a fully uh, software-driven pl- uh, wing on the planes. So it used to be you had manual control, but now it's you know through the computer. The software engineers who designed that were required to be on the first test flight. And it's such a beautiful alignment of incentives. You know, it's like mm. partially they needed to test some things, but also you better get this right because <laughs> you're the one who is bearing the cost. And I think that designing systems like that for your habits is also a powerful way to get behavior change uh, to happen. So um, if you feel like you're stuck, like an example, what would this look like for personal habits? Let's say, uh, let's say you go to bed tonight and you're like, all right, listen to this guy talk about habits today. Uh, tomorrow's going to be the day. I'm going to go for a run. And so you set your alarm for 6 a.m., and then six rolls around and your bed is warm and it's cold outside. And you're like, well, I'll just press snooze instead. But if you design a system where you bear an immediate cost, so like you come back to today and you text a friend and you say, hey, let's meet at the park at 615. Well, now 6 a.m. rolls around and your bed is still warm and it's still cold outside. But if you don't get up and go for a run, you're a jerk because you leave your friend at the park all alone. And so suddenly you bear that immediate cost, very similar to you know the manufacturing facility taking up the pollution they put in or whatever. So incentives in that way, designing systems where you get an immediate cost for your bad habits or an immediate reward for your good ones is a really good way to make it stick. The final thing that I'll add to this is that I do think there's a mindset shift that really helps. Um, and that is simply realizing that your habits pay off in the long run, that it takes a while for things to compound. The example that I use in the book is, say you walk into a room and it's cold, you can see your breath, and you got this ice cube sitting on the table, right? It's like 25 degrees. Start heating up the room, 26, 27, 28, ice cube's still there, 29, 30, 31, still there. And then you get to 32 degrees, and it's a one degree shift, no different than all the other shifts that came before it, but suddenly you hit this phase transition and the ice cube melts. And the process of building your habits is often like that, you know, like, the process of working on a habit for three months or six months and not having the results you want is kind of like complaining about heating an ice cube from like 25 to 31 degrees. Like it was the work was not wasted. It's just being stored, you know, like it's just you're building up this potential energy to hit that phase transition. And you have to have some level of faith, some level of commitment in your mindset to showing up each day and waiting for those long term rewards to accumulate. There's a quote that the San Antonio Spurs have in their locker room, and uh, they've won five NBA championships at this point. And the quote says something like, whenever I feel like giving up, I think about the stone cutter who takes his hammer and bangs on the rock a hundred times without it showing a crack. And then at the 101st blow, it splits in two. And I know that it wasn't the 101st that did it, but all the hundred that came before. And that is very much what it's like to build your habits. You know, it's like, it's not the last workout that makes you fit. It's all the ones that came before. It's not the last sentence that finishes the novel. It's all the ones that came before. And so you have to have at least some level of mental commitment, I think, to that process and realizing that most of the things that pay off in life have long-term rewards and take a while and you need to delay gratification. And you're not wasting your effort by putting those reps in. You're just building up potential energy to get to the next phase transition. You're, that work is being stored, not wasted. Love that. I think it's a good place to start wrapping up. James, where can people find you if they want to learn more other than or, or in addition to picking up Atomic Habits? Um, what else are you working yeah. on? What else do you want to make sure people know about? Well, uh, you know, I do think if you enjoyed this conversation, Atomic Habits is probably the best place to start. So that's at AtomicHabits.com. And if you want to see more of my work or sign up for the newsletter, uh, you can get all of that at JamesClear.com and uh, just click on newsletter and it'll be right there for you. James, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, Thank you to everybody out there listening. Thank you for sending us your questions, for leaving ratings and reviews. And Ben and I will see you again next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.